evening, everyone. You're all very welcome to the All Ireland Humanist Conference 2021. And tonight, of course, it's a joint event with our friends in Northern Ireland Humanists, and we look forward to working together on more such events moving forward. Um, if you are uh, new to humanism or this is your first meeting, you are especially welcome. And just to tell you a bit about um, our association, the Humanist Association of Ireland, our principal objective is to advance education and in particular the study of humanism and dissemination of knowledge of its principles. We aim to educate, support and represent people who seek to live full and responsible lives without religious beliefs and we also provide ceremonies for weddings, funerals and other occasions uh, through our accredited celebrants. In addition, uh, we have many local groups around the country and we hold a variety of events throughout the year promoting humanist ideals. Now, um, normally we give a definition of humanism from the, the HEO's definition. However, look, tonight is the definition of humanism. We have uh, two groups of uh, people um, usually divided by a man-made border coming together to share an evening of facts, evidence and research on one of the most important issues there is, the education systems, which so profoundly affects young people, with a view to contributing positively towards making it fair and more equitable for all. As it was so brilliantly put recently, education should be fact-based and facts do not have an ethos. So tonight's meeting, we will have uh, three presentations from four speakers. Each presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session. Depending on the running time of the meeting, uh, we may also have an extra period at the end for further questions. Now the meeting is being recorded for YouTube. So if you prefer, please switch off the camera on your phone, pad or laptop, but please uh, stick around. We have some fantastic presentations on the way. Okay, I shall now hand you over to my counterpart, Bide. So Bide, the floor is yours. Hi there. Um, thank you all so much for coming along. It's uh, really good to see such a good turnout from both um, the North of Ireland and the South of Ireland. Uh, and tonight should be a really interesting conversation. And it is actually the first joint event that ourselves and the Human Association of Ireland have carried out. And Tony quite well put, what um, the Humanist Association of Ireland does in, in, in the Republic of Ireland, and very much we do very much the similar sort of thing in Northern Ireland. Uh, we campaign on issues around education, around uh, equality of marriage, um, around reproductive rights. Uh, we also carry out our community services work, which includes non-religious pastoral care in the prisons and the hospitals. Uh, we have school speakers that go in to talk about um, uh, really talk about equality and human rights and skills and what humanism is uh, and, and we we broadly focus at the minute on, on our education work and and tonight um you will get a taste of some of that education work that uh, we, we carry out in northern ireland as well as as wider work and wider information from northern ireland and the republic of ireland but that we'll hear from some of our guests so um, tonight we will be hearing from uh, David Graham, who's the Communications Officer with Education Equality. We will be hearing from James Nelson and from Catherine Stapleton, who uh, work from, uh, who, James is a Senior Lecturer in the School of Social Sciences at Queen's University, and Catherine is a Lecturer in Education at MIC. Uh, and we'll be hearing about a bit of research that they have been working on over the last, I don't know, the last couple of years. I'm sure they'll be able to tell us um, a, a bit more about that, but it seems really interesting. Uh, and we will also be hearing from Dr. Ruth Wareham, who is my colleague and our education campaigns manager at Humanist UK. Uh, so to kick us off, it is Ruth this evening. If Ruth would like to unmute herself, um, uh, um, we can go from there. Hi, Ruth. Hi, brilliant. Thanks, Boyd. Um, so I don't have a presentation in the form of slides, so I'm just going to speak, basically, but uh, I'll just bring up my notes. Okay, so as Boyd said, I'm the Education Campaigns Manager at Humanist UK, and education has always been central to the work of Humanist UK, and that's largely because, as an organisation, what we aim at is securing autonomy and freedom of religion or belief for everyone. And essentially, we think that's only going to be achievable if our education systems change quite dramatically. So we work for an education system in which all schools have a pluralistic ethos, are open and accessible to all children, regardless of religion or belief background, and teach about religions and humanism in a broad, balanced and objective way. 
Now, because of its unique history, I think nowhere is this more important than in Northern Ireland. And the problem is that this unique history also means that the issues play out quite differently in Northern Ireland than perhaps they do in the rest of the UK where we work. So what I'm going to do is give you a quick overview of Northern Ireland humanist work in education and give you um, a sort of whistle stop tour of what we think are the key problems and issues with the education system in Northern Ireland as it is now. So obviously one of the most um, prominent uh, educational issues in Northern Ireland is that of segregation. Elsewhere in the UK, um, religiously selective admissions policies are a real problem and are a sort of driving factor in religious segregation in schools. But because of the broader community division and the geography of schools in Northern Ireland, they tend not to actually require religiously selective admissions because the communities uh, end up being largely self-segregating. Now that's not to say that there isn't strong support for integrated education um, where children from a variety of backgrounds are educated together. So the rough aim is sort of 40% 40, 40 from the Protestant community, 40% from the Catholic community and 20% from other communities. Now it's tending to push up into higher numbers of other communities, including the non-religious uh, who want integrated schools, but actually amongst parents, about 70% uh, say they would like an integrated school. Uh, the issue with this is that many can't actually access such a school because only 7% of the schools in Northern Ireland are integrated. Uh, with that in mind, we are currently supporting um, an integrated education bill, so a private members bill that's passing through the assembly at the moment, has just passed its second stage, and that seeks to ensure that there's a presumption that all new schools have integrated status. But there's still a problem for the non-religious with this and for minority religious groups, and that is that integrated schools still have a Christian ethos. Indeed, the uh, assembly member who is responsible for tabling the bill, Kelly Armstrong, um, has explicitly said that nothing in the bill takes away from the Christian basis of all schools in Northern Ireland. Now, that's obviously going to be problematic for the growing number of people in Northern Ireland who aren't Christian. And the latest Life and Time survey shows that 27% of people in Northern Ireland now identify as non-religious. And to give you an idea of what a surge that is, that proportion is now roughly on a par with the number of Catholics. So 28% of people in Northern Ireland identify as Catholic. Uh, and so it, it's not a minority anymore as such. It needs to be figured into how we set up the school system. And this Christian ethos of all Northern Ireland schools, including those which don't have a denominational religious character, so that those are what we call controlled schools and integrated schools, plays out in a variety of different ways and actually means that freedom of religion or belief for families in Northern Ireland and school choice, of course, is severely restricted. One of the ways in which this Christian ethos uh, evidences itself is through the religious education curriculum. The RE curriculum, uh, even for, as I said, non-denominational schools is written by the four main, i.e. largest churches and is almost entirely Christian in nature. I say almost entirely because there's one module on world religions and that's in the secondary curriculum and even there it's it's almost kind of a Christian appreciation that some other people might believe in different faiths. There's no requirement to teach about non-religious perspectives like humanism so they don't get a mention in this core curriculum at all. So again you've got 27% of the population an increasing number not uh, evident in the RE curriculum whatsoever. Uh, 
there's also a requirement to carry out a daily act of collective worship. Now, there's nothing in the law that requires worship to be Christian, um, and that's not the case in England and Wales. There it is explicitly Christian, but because of the surrounding law and uh, the requirements about RE, it invariably has a Christian character. Parents do have the option to withdraw their children from both RE and collective worship, but no meaningful alternative is provided at all. And that process can be difficult and isolating. So you end up in a situation where you're choosing between your child either being indoctrinated into a Christian perspective or being isolated from their peers. And at the moment, um, uh, next month, actually, um, there's a legal case that's going to be heard in the High Court where a parent and a child are actually challenging the fact that there is no meaningful alternative to uh, Christian religious education and collective worship in schools in Northern Ireland. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens with respect to that. Uh, another factor in um, this kind of Christian ethos problem in schools in Northern Ireland is uh, teacher employment and boards of governors. So as in England and Wales, schools in Northern Ireland have an exemption to equality law, which means they can employ, promote and remunerate teachers on the basis of faith. And that generally means that teachers with a Catholic background almost always work in Catholic schools and teachers with a Protestant background almost always work in controlled schools. And the cycle of segregation continues because children aren't exposed to those from different backgrounds. Um, it's exacerbated by the fact that um, teacher training colleges also tend to be segregated in this way. And the requirement for all primary teachers and secondary school leaders and teachers of RE and Catholic schools to have the Catholic certificate in RE cements that segregation further. So it makes it difficult to be mobile between the different sectors. Um, and then the problems is exacerbated again by rules that require boards of governors who share the faith of the school and in some circumstances are actually appointed purely for their faith affiliation rather than any real ability to carry out their duties. Um, another area where the religious ethos of schools causes problems is with respect to relationships and sex education. So relationships and sex education have actually been statutory in Northern Ireland for quite a long time, longer than it has been uh, in England, where it's only just been recently uh, introduced. Um, it was introduced in 2007 in Northern Ireland, um, but it has to be taught in line with the ethos, the Christian ethos of the school. And as a result, it often leaves out or distorts important aspects of the curriculum, especially content on things like LGBT inclusion, abortion, contraception, and so on, what are seen as controversial issues. And that's explicit in the statutory guidance on the subject. And in one primary school in uh, Kalinchi in, in Northern Ireland, um, the, this problem of RSE and church appointed governors really did cause a barrier to RSE being being taught because a church appointed governor was able to entirely block the teaching of RSE on the basis that he believed that basic lessons on puberty, naming body parts and personal hygiene, um, which he which were planned within the school immaculately. Like they really thought about liaising with parents, talking about what they were going to be teaching, were really, really carefully thinking through their RSE curriculum. And even this wasn't permitted because it was seen as not being in line with the teachings of the church. Now, luckily, uh, that governor was eventually forced to resign after lots of complaints from parents, but it just goes to show the way the system is stacked in, in favour of religion. So from all this, it's clear that Northern Ireland has a really long way to go in terms of securing inclusive pluralistic education like the kind I talked about at the outset. But it is worth saying, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. There are lots of positive changes that seem to be happening now. And I'm actually 
kind of more heartened by progress in Northern Ireland at the moment than I am by progress uh, in England, to be honest with you. Perhaps it's something to do with having a really long way to go that, um, you know, people start to get on board with, with changes. Whereas I think in England, the thought is just, well, all this isn't really a problem anymore. So I think people recognise in Northern Ireland that, that this is a problem. And that means we've got things like the aforementioned integrated education bill, which although, you know, we think that it doesn't quite go far enough, would be a really positive way to see schools teaching children from all different backgrounds alongside one another. Um, another private members bill proposed by the Alliance MLA, who's also the head of the Stormont Education Committee, Chris Little, um, has been proposed to remove that teacher exemption to equality law and uh, make sure that, you know, teachers aren't being employed on the basis of their faith. Um, the Department of Education has commissioned an independent review of education that has within its remit looking at specifically securing what it calls a single system of education. And there's real cross party support for that in principle, although I think there's going to be a lot of disagreement over what this single system of education looks like. Um, and Northern Ireland Humanists uh, as an organisation, uh, we're working on various things, but one of those is a guide to help support uh, non-religious parents and uh, explain what their rights are, uh, etc. And we're looking to publish that this, this autumn. So there are, there are positive things on the horizon, but yeah, still a long way to go. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ruth. Um, that, that, that was really, really, it was really, really good. As somebody who lives in Northern Ireland and works alongside Ruth, I, I, I am basically supporting everything that she says there. And, and what, what is quite interesting as well is uh, what with the work that Ruth and I have been doing around the education curriculum uh, and, and the legislation around um, education in Northern Ireland is that there is actually a lot more openness for, for change, even within the legislation. The, troubles, the trouble is that we do live in a divided community where people who are, you, you still have that attitude of, well, my, I went to the Catholic school down the road, so my son's going to go there, my daughter's going to go there, and everybody's going to go there, and oh, they went to St. Mary's Training College, so that's where you're going to go, and it, that's, it, 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 the division exists in society itself as well, so there, there, there are many, many issues that we need to address, but certainly the, the, the simple fact that our schooling systems are still totally, real, well, really in te technically divided, um, we need to address it and address it in a, in a much more sort of um, uh, focused manner, I think, and, and that's what we are, are, are attempting to do. So um, on Ruth's talk, um, and I guess maybe I can help maybe answer some of the questions on the work that we're doing in Northern Ireland as well. Um, would anybody like to ask any questions? Yes, guys, anyone who'd like to ask a question, um, just click on um, the three dots down the bottom and use the raise hand symbol, or else if you go into chat as well, or messages, you can raise your hand from there. I think we also, okay, yeah, we, if you click on, if you're on the PC or laptop, if you click on reactions down the bottom, you can go to raise hand, and we'll see you then. Okay. So um, actually, Ruth, uh, before we just start the questions, um, can you get a copy of that electronic guide to us? It sounds fantastic when you have yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Once it's, once it's ready for publication, we can definitely, definitely send it over. So it's, it's something we've been working on. We've got one for, for England and Wales already, and it just seems remiss of us not to, not to have one on Northern Ireland, particularly given the complexities in there. In the system. Okay, um, we have a question for you. Um, Katrina, is it? Uh, yes, um, I was just wanting to say I was raised, well, born and raised a uh, fundamentalist Catholic, and I went to uh, uh, a Catholic school both times in uh, primary and secondary. Uh, not much has changed, and it's, it's so, not much has changed in the way that they're. Uh, teaching sex ed. Uh, so sad to, to hear that there's still people doing uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but hopefully we can uh, get, convince them to 
uh, move forward with the times a bit. Yeah, well, there's, I mean, the pressure does need to be put on in terms of our sex education in schools, simply because it, it is incredibly distorted. I mean, there's 75% um, of schools in Northern Ireland don't even teach anything around LGBT issues. And some of the comments from schools when asked why they weren't teaching about it was, well, we don't have any gay people in the school. And it's like, well, that's, you know, statistical impossibility at times when you've got, you know, if you've got 50 students there, you know, you, you, you know, it's, it's a statistical impossibility that you don't have somebody there that you would be from the LGBT community. Um, so it, it is, it is again, an interesting thing that needs to be addressed and needs to be spoken about. And we need to break down the taboos about talking about, um, about sex and, and relationships um, just in general, I think as well. And that, and that, that should also help put, um, pressure on the government to change and, and but a more focused campaign needs to be addressed on that as well. I certainly think in terms of, I mean, before you even get to, to talking about LGBT people, I mean, the thing that was so shocking about the Kalinchi case was just the level of what those children were going to be taught was just the basic naming of basic body parts and yeah. personal hygiene, like the real basic nuts and bolts stuff that you need to know just to kind of understand your what's happening to your body as you go through puberty and so that yeah there's a real uphill battle if you think that even telling children that is yeah. going against I mean, some sort of religious ethos that's that's a real worry it was i mean the, the way even the curriculum the, the way that the, the head teacher had had gone about uh, you know consulting with the parents uh, about the curriculum and deciding what to do i mean the, the first the first lesson for rst it was actually going to be for primary two and it was the same lesson that they were going to use throughout the rest of the year groups and then year on year they were going to add the next part of the the year group so it was it was it was RSE light, I think, as, as it was described at one point, you know, it was, but it was very well thought out and it, and it was a considerable challenge, you know, and in terms of what, what the teacher experienced, what some of the parents experienced, and in actual fact, in the end, what, what some of us from the organization experienced from, from dealing with that. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was interesting to say the least, um, but yeah. There were definitely, yeah. Some, yeah. some strange background stuff going on with that and some of which we we can't really share in a public forum but yeah, yeah. um so there's a, somebody had made a point here here in the south children have the constitutional right not to attend religious instruction schools are obliged to say how they will facilitate this in their administration policies but yeah i mean yeah we we there 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 again there there are the, what we find is that we get a lot of parents contacting us who you know are talk about wanting to opt out what those rules and regulations are and um, there, there's good practice and at least with all within uh, i think it's the department of education website they asked that um that within the uh, prospectus that you put in what the opt, opt out options are and what what is available there uh, we looked, started looking into a number of skill. Well, we started looking at the websites and RE prospectuses, and I think I'd looked at uh, over 200 prospectuses, and there was only four that had it included at that point. Um, and, and we know that sometimes parents are told, "Oh no, no, they can't opt out of it," and we we have to send them back with the Education and Libraries Act legislation to say, "Here it is in writing," in order in order for 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 the for the school to take it on board. Now. I have to say that it's not, well, yes, it's it's always the fault of the school if they're saying that they can't opt out when they can, um, but sometimes the teachers are actually not aware of the legislation, you know, um, and, and they're not aware of what it is that they have to provide when opt out. Now, I think that's less and less over the last few years that we've <laughs> sort of been saying it quite loudly and uh, and, 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 and making sure that it is, that it is addressed, uh, but, but certainly it, it is still an issue where teachers aren't always aware of what all the processes are, what they might be correct in saying or, or wrong in saying. And I think the other issue with, with opt-outs uh, in Northern Ireland um, is the fact that there's no opt-out for children and young people, even older children and young people who you know, know their own minds, know that they're not Christian, 
they still have to attend, you know, if their parents say they have to attend, they have to attend. And in terms of collective worship, that is out of step with England and Wales, where at least sixth form pupils are allowed to opt themselves out of worship. Um, so, you know, there is a concern that it, it's violating children's rights, not just parents' parents' rights. And that's that's something that forms the basis of some evidence that we gave to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, who's in the, who are in the process of reviewing uh, the UK's children's rights provision. And the last time they reported, they they um, recommended that um, collective worship be repealed, uh, and nothing has been done in any of the, the nations of the UK. And so this time around, they're asking again, what have you done to repeal and, and nothing at all. And it is a, a big children's rights issue, really, because you know it, it doesn't matter if your parents think that you ought to be attending these sessions once you're you know, at least sort of at secondary school age, you've got your own thoughts and uh, beliefs on this, this matter and I think if children are mature enough to make those decisions though those decisions ought to be uh, respected. I see. Da and we have another question there, David McConnell. Thank you very David, much Tony. Thank, thank you Tony, can you hear me? Yes, you got them clear. I'd just like to thank Ruth for a, a splendid uh, opening address, I think it's extremely useful and I was wondering if she would be prepared to uh, uh, put uh, that down on paper, in particular in the form of a comparison between the, um, the uh, challenges in the North of Ireland and the challenges in Britain. Um, it's only relatively recently that I've discovered the uh, uh, astonishing backwardness of, of, the, of the English uh, system. I'm not sure about the Scottish or the Welsh. And it's quite an eye-opener. And a relatively short article comparing the restrictions in, in Britain broadly speaking, uh, including Northern Ireland, I think would be very useful. So, um, and I'm sure in, in, in the Re Republic in HAI, we'd like to put that up on our website. So to, to show people, you know, that uh, we're not alone in this. I mean, there are big problems in, in, in our neighboring island as well. The other thing I wanted to mention, uh, ask was this, uh, the collective worship that is required by law in Britain. And as you said, I think uh, it must be Christian. Does that mean that in schools which are predominantly um, attended by students, say, uh, from the Indian or Pakistani communities in different parts of Britain, say, in Leicester or Radford or wherever, that they must have a collective um, worship in the morning, which is Christian? Thank you very right. much. I'll take those. Um, I'll take the second question first. So on collective worship. So the default is Christian worship, and that's in schools without a religious character. If it's a faith school, obviously it goes along with the trust deeds of the school. However, if it's a school that has multiple children from another faith other than Christianity, the school can apply for something called a determination, which would get them out of the Christian part of worship, but not the worship part. So conceivably where I live in, in Birmingham, a school that had a very high proportion of Muslim pupils could opt for Muslim worship. Uh, similarly, you could be in an area that has lots of different faiths and you could have something like multi-faith worship. The issue is that you can't opt out of the worship bit. So there is no non-religious option, even if the vast majority of the pupils at your school come from non-religious backgrounds, you can't get rid of worship. And worship this means the worship of God. So worship means in the most recent guidance, and it will tell you the level of priority that the government puts on this, because the most recent guidance was written in 1994. Um, but the most recent guidance uh, says worship has its ordinary meaning and its ordinary meaning is reverence for a deity and something along those lines or, or a higher power. So, yeah, worship means prayer effectively. Now, lots of schools aren't necessarily compliant with that. They there is all sorts of provision that happens. But we would like to see the worship bit replaced with inclusive assemblies you know, that talk about religion and belief, but are suitable for 
all regardless of their backgrounds and actually that's the subject of a private members bill that's going through the house of lords at the moment and just had its its second reading that we assisted with the the drafting of um but yeah i mean it's it's a tricky one because most parents don't know about it so we did some polling recently and found that 65 percent of parents in the poll did have no idea that this was a thing in schools without a religious character. They think they go to secular schools. There aren't any secular schools in, in England because there's this requirement. Um, so, yeah, um, I will just say very quickly, Wales is a little bit more positive, not on the worship side. They've still got the collective worship, but in RE, they've just introduced, um, well, they've just passed a, a new curriculum act and that will see um, the RE curriculum fully inclusive of non-religious worldviews. Um, it removes the right to withdraw because it's supposed to be taught in a critical, objective, pluralistic manner. And they're renaming it religion, values and ethics. So there is some positive movement in Wales. Um, and I'd be happy to do a comparative uh, document to, to share on your website. I think that's a really, really good idea. And we've got probably most of the information we need that can to, to corral together for that. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Dara, um, Dara Hogan has the next question. Okay, here we go. Yes. Hi, Ruth. Thank you very much. That was, that was terrific. Um, one of my, my thoughts is uh, what might have been I mean, their, their community division is very deep in Northern Ireland. The violence has ended, but that's about all you can say. And I wonder what would happen if today's adults had been educated at integrated schools 20 and 30 years ago, if they played sports together, if they'd sung in choirs together, if they'd socialised, if they'd learned together, how much different would it be? And ergo, should not, we not start now straight away and eliminate and uh, denominations from schools and just have all children educated together. Is this just a pipe dream or uh, am I right that we're long overdue doing this? I mean, I think you're right. We're long overdue doing it. I think that it could be a reality. I think there's a lot of positive support for educating children alongside one another. It, it, yes. Even in Northern Ireland, I think there's a lot of support for that and I think the reason there's a lot of support for it is but that people know that it works you know there's lots and lots of evidence to suggest that if people are educated together that it it promotes positive attitudes to out groups now it's got to be done in the right way you can't just plonk people together and not try and actually integrate within the school I mean we've seen issues with that um, in in England as well as the rest of the UK if you just plonk children together and expect them to get on you might get sort of resegregation within the school so you've got to it's got to be the right sort of contact I mean the contact hypothesis says it's not just contact it's positive contact but schools are the best place for that right so um, sure. and there's lots of there's lots of good evidence to suggest that that this could work and the fact that it's you know most parents want this the you know, vast majority of parents want to choose an integrated school, but can't because only 7% of schools are, are currently integrated. So that tells you all you need to know, I think. That I, so I'm hopeful. I don't think it's a pipe dream, no. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Thanks, Tony. Okay, and we have a couple of questions there is coming on the messages. One is, um, if the parents win this legal case, what will the consequences of the ruling be? Well, it will depend on how that ruling plays out, really, because what what would happen if they won would be that the government would have to, um, you know, make some sort of change in line with whatever that ruling was. Um, we would hope that that would mean getting rid of the presumption of a Christian ethos and introducing, uh, you know, inclusive assemblies and inclusive RE, or at least um, broadening uh, the stakeholders in producing the RE syllabus. But what can be problematic with judicial review is that even if you get a ruling in your favour, it still relies on the government or the, the public decision maker, whoever it is you're, you're taking a judicial review against, doing the right thing 
And if they don't do the right thing, yes, you can conceivably go back to court and, and try and get them to, to change again because you can say, right, well, this is still unlawful. But it can be a really long process. And sometimes you can win cases and still not see the change that you want to see. So a good example of this is um, in England uh, in 2015, some humanist parents actually won a legal case um, which said that the um, some government guidance which basically said that it was fine for schools to teach the GCSE syllabus which only required that you teach two religions and didn't require the coverage of non-religious worldviews at all. It was fine if you taught that for statutory RE at key stage four and Basically, we won this case on, on the fact that that wouldn't be critical, objective and pluralistic. It didn't treat non-religious worldviews on an equal footing with um, religious worldviews. But after winning that case, all that happened was that the, the government issued some sort of bulletproof guidance, which just ignored that ruling and also just left it up to local authorities to decide what went on the curriculum. So even though we won that case in 2015, we're still fighting to get the changes that that case makes very clear are lawful. So yeah, I, so on the one hand, it could be brilliant if we win this legal case and it could lead to, to massive change in Northern Ireland but I'm trying to sort of sit on my expectations just on the basis that I've seen what happens sometimes you win a case and it's a bit of a pyrrhic victory you don't actually get the change that you want so you have to keep fighting even after you win which is seems bizarre but that that is the reality of it. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that, Ruth. Um, fantastic Thank presentation. You. Our next speaker tonight is uh, David Graham. David is the Communications Officer with Education Equality, a human rights advocacy group campaigning for equal respect for all children in school, regardless of religion. And he has also worked in the area of education, both locally and nationally since 2016. And uh, David's also very active on social media and the print media as well, campaigning um, constantly and tirelessly uh, to that end. So, uh, Dave, the floor is yours. Okay, Dave, if you like, um, you sent me a copy of your presentation there. So if it's unchanged from the one you sent me, I can share it on my screen and you can just tell me to move the slides on. I, I, I tell you what, I might suggest I, I changed it slightly. Uh, and perhaps what you might want to do is just move on to the next speaker and I can email you the latest version and then hopefully in the next half an hour or so we can, or yeah. whenever it is in 20 yeah. minutes, then we can pick up where we left off, if that makes sense. Yep, that's fantastic. Okay. Perfect. Um, our next uh, two Thanks speakers very much. this evening are James Nelson and Catherine Stapleton. Now, Catherine is a lecturer in education at MIC St. Patrick's Campus, Tortoise. She teaches modules on diversity and intercultural education and research methods. Her current research is focused on religion and belief inclusion in educational contexts. Her research projects are funded by the Irish Research Council, Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, and SCOTEMS as well. Also, uh, we have James Nelson. Uh, James is a senior lecturer in the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work at Queen's University in Belfast. His research involves investigating religion and education in various contexts on the island of Ireland. He has carried out work on shared education, community national schools, and the teaching of religious education in Northern Ireland. So whenever you're ready, Caden James, it's all yours. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, uh, Tony, and it's great to be here, and thank you for the invitation. And myself and James are going to share this presentation. Um, so I'll start the presentation, and then James will come in for... Um, the interesting bit, I suppose, the main findings. Um, so our research was looking at uh, non-religious teachers in schools with a religious ethos, both in the Republic and Northern Ireland, and their experience, their lived experiences of recruitment and promotion. So in both jurisdictions, um, there is exemptions uh, to employment law um, covered under the Northern Ireland Fair Employment and Treatment Order and the Irish Employment Equality Act. And historically, these exemptions have been justified on 
the grounds of religion and the right of religious schools to appoint teachers who share their beliefs. And I suppose we think that over time, things have changed and populations on both sides of the borders have become more religiously diverse. And that idea of cultural encapsulation, so going to the same school, uh, being taught in a school of one faith, going to teacher training college of the same faith, and then going back into the same system um, to teach is, is no longer tenable um, or um, desirable. Um, there's a significant rise in the number of people with no religious belief, I suppose, particularly among young people as well. And, it, you know, to see uh, the statistics that Ruth share that 70% of parents uh, have a parental preference for um, an integrated education system is, is, is really important. Um, and in both jurisdictions, there is uncertainty around what counts as a religious school and how the exemptions um, from equality legislation are interpreted and, it, and, and applied. And also the terminology is very generous in comparison to other European states. So we wanted to see um, what the actual impact was on the ground. So in our literature, we looked at the history, that nature of ethos, and again, the diversity of beliefs. So I suppose we look back in history to the establishment of um, post-primary schools in the 17th century um, by the British, then British government to foster the English language, culture, and Anglican religion. And then we had the penal laws, which prohibited Catholic education and fuel tensions, which resulted in the 1778 rising and the passing of the Catholic Relief Bill. And then the British government tried to establish a multi-denominational school system. Um, but that was opposed by both Catholic and Protestant clergy. And as we can see, the, the vision was further strengthened um, in 1922. And while the new state provided um, for the salaries of teachers, they depended very much on the church to run the schools and to establish new schools. Um, and, and so we have the, the system that we have today, um, which is very segregated on religious grounds. And even in the, after the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland, that exemption um, in employment of teachers and remained. And then we looked at the nature of ethos. And again, I think this very much talks to what Ruth was saying about that complexity around language and how it's interpreted. interpreted. And the fact that 65% of parents were not aware of the collective worship um, that's actually uh, uh, part and parcel of the system um, is, is very interesting. And like I interviewed teachers and they themselves weren't sure what the ethos of the school they were teaching in was. So there's a lot of confusion around that, particularly in the ETB sector in the South and in the Northern Ireland control schools, because they've, they've grown up in this history, um, which is very segregated on religious grounds and supported um, Christian values and principles. Um, and so it became almost the status quo or just what had what has always happened and although there are um moves afoot particularly with the etb sector in um, the republic to to change that um that traditional practice and adopt a more multi-denominational um ethos it, it still very much uh, depends on on what's happening at local level in, in, in each school, because as, you, as we know, the boards of management manage the schools still. So then we looked at the diversity of beliefs and, um, you know, the, the non-religious group is a very uh, broad category. Um, and 
when we were interviewing, asking for participants, uh, we use the term non-religious um, because I suppose people identify um, in many different ways. I even read recently that young people are, are finding that community and that sense of moral purpose by joining organizations um, that are involved in environmental action or the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and it's very difficult to actually identify um, people's individual beliefs. We've looked at the idea of cultural Catholicism and multiple religious belongings and the idea of the flaneur, um, which Wallace, Willis and Skunk talk about, that idea of being interested in many religions, but uh, preferring um, the freedom and the complexity rather than adopting any particular belief. Um, so then we move on to the actual research questions. James can move it on there. Yeah. So the aims of our study then was very um, specifically to what extent is religion or belief a factor in the appointment or promotion of non-religious teachers in post-primary schools with a religious ethos? And how do non-religious teachers experience and manage the religious expectations regarding appointments and promotions in post-primary schools with a religious ethos? So these are the two main things that we looked at. And our research methodology then, we used um, semi-structured interviews. Um, we interviewed in total 15 post-primary teachers who self-identified as non-religious, five were from Northern Ireland and 10 were from the, from the Republic. And when interviewed, 14 were currently teaching in post-primary schools and one had left the teaching profession. And um, due to the restrictions of COVID-19, because these interviews were carried out in June, between June and um, September 2020, uh, we interviewed um, everybody online. And it was actually quite challenging at the onset um, to get people to participate um, in this study, because I suppose for a long time, um, teachers have kind of practiced, non-religious teachers not um, being vocal about their beliefs or their difference. And, and I'll let James uh, fill you in on some of our findings, um, which give very valid reasons why um, teachers um, do not um, often um, identify or vocalize about their uh, non-religious uh, beliefs. So I'll let James uh, take over now. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Kate. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I was just thinking it's lovely to be able to present our research, uh, which is an all-island piece of research, to an all-island audience as our first audience. So uh, that's a really uh, special privilege for us. Um, so I want to take you through uh, some of the findings that uh, came out of our conversations with these 15 teachers. And while I will be presenting these as kind of broad uh, responses and broad themes. I think it's very important that, you know, this kind of research that is uh, qualitative, it actually, um, though, uh, touches on the depth of some of the responses and the, the fact that when we were doing this, we really had a strong sense of the change or the difference or the importance that all of this had in people's lives uh, on, a, on a real and emotional basis and as well as an economic basis as well. So uh, we did find it as quite a, a challenging piece of work even to, uh, to conduct. Um, so first of all, what did we find? Well, we find that religion or own belief is undoubtedly a factor in appointments and promotions of teachers in our sample who designate themselves as being in, uh, uh, applying for jobs in non-religious schools. Um, it was amazing to me a few years back when the chair of one of the ca Catholic um, bodies in Northern Ireland uh, for education said that we'd never use exemptions in um, employment uh, and we have no intention of ever using it. And on one level he was right, there are no jobs that are advertised in Ireland, North or South with the strap line, only Catholics need apply. But this misleading, therefore, to say that absolutely uh, all jobs or 
were open to everyone. Uh, the, 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 the two things um, are, are, are quite, uh, quite different. Um, uh, schools uh, do engage in practices that wouldn't be acceptable in other fields of employment when it comes to um, uh, appointing teachers. Um, and they benefit from the exemption from equality law in, in uh, this way. So beliefs are taken into account, particularly in Catholic schools, in uh, application forms, in interviews, and in a few cases, uh, individuals reported um, around the fringes, as it were, of the employment process and conversations with principals um, around job conditions or whatever. It was made very clear um, that uh, they were looking for people of a certain uh, belief or uh, with certain acceptability to the school in terms of their um, ability to consent to the, the belief systems and participation in the belief systems in the school. But that's not to say that it's only Catholic authorities that um, are uh, in play here. Uh, interestingly, uh, there are many, as Kate said, many other religious schools in Northern Ireland, which we might call sort of religious legacy or Christian legacy schools, in that they're not denominational, they're not attached to a specific church, but they have a history of having a Christian ethos and they maintain and continue that. And even if they don't ask for evidence of that in a, uh, an interview or on an application form, it was interesting that these things did come through uh, over time. And what do I mean by that? Well, actually, when a teacher applies for a job in a school, they may get a job um, as a beginning teacher for a few months or for a year or even for two years, but that job is not permanent. And so, um, over time, um, what happens is that uh, teachers, even if uh, jobs aren't uh, advertised as religious or not religious, teachers are assessed on their suitability or fit um, for religion within the whole school, even in schools like ETB schools and controlled schools that do not ask about religion in interviews or in uh, on application forms. So this link that we find between temporary contracts and the kind of screening of non-religious teachers is a reality in the experience of many teachers and does put some teachers off. It sends them to other schools, sends them to um, uh, 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 apply in other places as well. So ultimately it creates this level of employment uncertainty. I'll just share a few quotes. Uh, and this, this particular uh, participant, uh, I mean, I spoke about emotional and economic uh, impact, and this uh, is exactly what happened to this teacher who, having applied for uh, and worked in many different school types, um, found that she could not uh, eventually stay in a job because of the demands that were being made on her uh, in terms of the religious elements of the school. And she said, well, it dislocates you in a career way, uh, socially as well, but because, but also there are economic results. And she reflected on a job that she just simply had to leave, even though it could have been uh, a job which gave her a more, uh, paid her mortgage. Um, and uh, and she, she, you know, she doesn't have that opportunity anymore uh, because she, she couldn't um, uh, face the, the religious impositions of the school. Um, others would say, well, you know, I, I just you know, don't say that much because I realize that if I could lose my job over this, over um, what, what I think or feel or believe, then I'll, uh, I'll just keep quiet. And um, others, uh, another saying, I would like to be more outspoken, but interesting phrase, you don't bite the hand that feeds you either. So there is real employment uncertainty for uh, teachers who are non-religious within a system that is, uh, it takes a kind of uh, re religion by default in, uh, in schools. So second other uh, slide about findings, and that was just around how do teachers manage these religious working cultures that they find themselves in? Well, um, what I would say is that we were surprised to find that teachers themselves were surprised by the expectations they encountered in schools and the assumption that they would somehow conform to or contribute to religious culture. Um, and even though some of these 
teachers had been to religious schools themselves, they hadn't sort of joined the dots and thought, oh yeah, well, if I go to uh, and teach in a religious school, then I have a responsibility in some respects for um, um, uh, maintaining that religious ethos. And that came, came, what came with that was a range of things from attending mass uh, or assemblies. Uh, some were expected to pray, pray in class, um, lighting candles and staff meetings, and even attending uh, pilgrimages or retreats. Uh, and th these were kind of natural assumptions of what they would um, what they would do. And many teachers went along with it, many non-religious teachers, simply because of this worry about their employment prospects and um, uh, also because uh, uh, then they lacked confidence in owning or expressing their non-religious identity. Um, as well as that, um, we found that the religious climate permeated much of their professional relationships. And those were relationships with the other teachers, but even with students and senior staff. Uh, some spoke of fear um, uh, about you know, being open about their non-religious views or their ethical positions. And uh, they, they, in a sense, self-policed themselves as well to silence themselves, um, again, uh, for concerns that they may uh, do damage to their either their employment opportunities or to their promotion opportunities. Um, uh, indeed, uh, this suppression of their own positions caused many of them to experience some dissonance, some uh, real ethical conflicts. And we'll see that in um, uh, the way in which they played roles, I suppose. Uh, and I have a few quotes to show you that in a second. So overall, um, there is a chill factor when it comes to being a non-religious teacher uh, applying for jobs in religious schools. And religious school means um, both schools that are denominational and schools that have religious characteristics, even if they're not denominational. And so when it comes to promotion, they, there is a strong sense of a, a glass ceiling uh, for, for these teachers. Uh, here's a quote from one teacher. Um, who spoke about how she played a role. Uh, she was non-religious, but she just went along with things um, uh, and uh, participated in assemblies and so on. And as she said, there's a lot of existential questions in there. Like, what am I actually doing when I'm going along with all of this and I believe none of it? This is an example of one teacher who uh, found herself encouraging and even putting pressure on young people in her class to participate in religious services, even though she herself was non-religious because of the atmosphere of the schools. She was basically bullied into bullying other uh, these, these young people into uh, uh, conforming to the religion and uh, religious practices in the schools. And so in terms of promotion, um, again, there was a strong feeling from participants that um, uh, being non-religious would definitely limit your uh, career prospects. Uh, some saying, well, I could maybe get some kind of role in the school uh, further up the, 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 the promotion chain, but definitely not a senior post. And this one is from a, a, a teacher in the north um, who uh, was seeking uh, promotion. And he said to the principal, uh, uh, I'm non-religious. Is this going to stop me from progressing in my career if I put my roots down here? And the principle was, well, maybe in like the pastoral side of things. And that didn't sit well with me at all. And I thought, he says, look, I'm not convinced that I can go in there and wholly, fully do my job, fully, wholly and properly. If I'm being told that I can't somehow be acceptable to the pastoral wing of the school life. He did accept the job. He went through with it. And a year later, in a sense, he realized that this did come to fruition. He wasn't comfortable and he wasn't uh, able to put his roots down and he moved on to another job eventually. So, um, and again, uh, if you are non-religious, you're seen as a potential problem uh, in terms of promotion to a senior place within a school. So those are the, some of the core findings. And we uh, also then, came up in the end with some recommendations. And I'm gonna hand back to Kate just to run through these quickly. Kate, are you there? 
So yeah, we came up with some of these findings based on what's happening in, in different countries in Europe and also uh, based on um, United Nations directives and that on, on where there is conflict, you know, it's about um, getting people to respect each other and tolerate each other rather than segregate. Um, so we felt that there needs to be a change in the law in both jurisdictions to bring schools in both Ireland, both parts of the Ireland under unfair employment legislation. And, and just to say, when we were making decisions about um, the findings and how we would present them, we, I think initially we both thought that probably we would be presenting the Northern Ireland um, studies separately to um, the, the studies in, in the South, to the, but that didn't happen. There was no need because the themes were, were similar across both jurisdictions. Um, the experiences of teachers were very similar. Um, and we really feel that there's need, a need for a clearly defined designation for schools. So, you know, and what it would mean, what it means to be a teacher in that school, what are the expectations? Um, what role does religion play in, in each type of school? Because it was, it was very confusing um, to try and, 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 and sort out that, that whole idea of ethos. And that any exceptions to employment law would align with the European directive regarding proof of genuine occupational requirement and be context specific and, and proportional. Um, so that, you know, the case for some um, uh, denominational schools that at present the law kind of covers all teachers employed in the school, where we would think that it'd be far fairer and more proportional um, that it would be restricted to a few posts so that there would be a genuine occupational requirement. Um, and also, you know, at a minimum that there would be the opt-out provision or the conscience clause would be um, available for teachers. And that really and truly, there should be a proactive recruitment of a diverse teaching workforce um, to mirror the, the student population. And teachers were very much, um, they were very adamant that we needed not only to change legislation, but also to change the culture in the school. And, and just thinking about what Ruth said earlier, you know, it, changing the legislation is one thing, but actually making a change in practice is another um, day's work and um, but teachers were, were very much wanted that so they were very against the idea of segregation um, as well and, and, and they wanted um, to learn from um, each other's uh, belief systems and and that that would benefit um, pupils um, as well and, and they, they saw that and they were very um, cognizant of the diversity of uh, the student population. And, and I think that can only um, expand going forward. Um, so there they are our recommendations and I'd really like to hear um, your opinions on them. Do they go far enough? And, and that, that ends our presentation. Yeah, I would just want to say one final thing, and that is that um, we have a report that we can't share, so I'll put that in the chat. <laughs> okay, thanks for that, James. And um, Ruth, or sorry, uh, Kate as well, thanks both of you. Um, amazing presentation there, especially with um, the real world stories as well from the teachers. It's some of it gut wrenching stuff, it really is. Okay, do we have any questions um, for our two guest speakers? If you just like to uh, raise your hands, you can click on reactions and go to raise hands or else if you just like, if you're having an issue with that, yeah, you can just unmute yourself and um, the screen will jump over to you when you start speaking. Okay, uh, Ruth, we have, uh, if you just unmute yourself there, Ruth, you can ask your question. Yeah, sorry, it's a, it's a little bit of a geeky sort of technical question that I just wanted to ask uh, James and Kate, which was about the European directive and it's standing now in in Northern Ireland. 
because we're still trying to get clear about precisely um, what its standing is in, in the UK because it was mistransposed into, into UK law, which meant that, that there's, there's been a, a, a bit of a problem in the rest of the, the UK post Brexit that some of those things were meant to fall away at that point. But it does seem to be uh, at retained law on the uh, UK government website. So we're still trying to establish where it stands. I mean, obviously, even when it when it was in place, um, we weren't getting a genuine occupational requirement uh, for teachers. It's the same in England and in in Wales as well. Um, but yeah, I'm just I'm just wondering what your thoughts were on that. We've been trying to consult with our, our lawyers, but they haven't got back to us on it yet. Um, I'm maybe uh, take that up, uh, Ruth. We don't have any more light to shed on it, apart from the fact that, as far as I'm aware, all of the European law, you know, transferred into UK law, and that there has been no change that I'm aware of, certainly with regards to Northern Ireland in adjusting the European directive on this. Um, so it it, it stands as is. Uh, but if you again, equally, if you yeah. find a lawyer that <laughs> well, else, I'm I'm I'll hoping you're it, right. I mean, it's what I've been. It, I've sort of been working under the tentative assumption that it does still stand, but we we haven't been able to to fully firm it up yet. But of course, you know, there are lots of issues in terms of what's happening post Brexit in Northern Ireland. So uh, yes, this is just one one of those issues, I guess. Okay, um, David, can we have your question, please? And we just need you to unmute there. How's that? Can you hear me? Perfect, yeah. So, so thank you, Katie and James. I mean, I was struck, uh, I'm sorry to say, I suppose, um, that you were only able to interview 15 people and you hinted that it was very difficult to get people to take part. Mm. Um, indicating, of course, that there's a significant um, anxiety, uh, very significant anxiety, I would say, in people uh, uh, coming forward for this kind of survey. Would you, would you say a little bit more about how you tried to obtain such people? Did you advertise fairly widely? Um, how, how, did you, how did you find, how did you seek participants and how many would you have liked to have got? I know, I know that's, uh, how long is a piece of strength, but still. The question with participants in your survey. Yeah, so we, we contacted um, different non-religious organizations, so the humanist associations, and um, we also went on Facebook and tried to promote it that way. And um, to be honest, we, we struggled. So we, um, Mary Immaculate College actually shared it on um, all their platforms. Um, and then we were a little bit concerned that maybe, um, you know, some teachers who are non-religious mightn't um, be accessing different um, websites or uh, online communication. So we used snowball sampling then where we asked if we, if we found a participant to ask them, could they, um, you know, ask colleagues that might be interested um, in participating, but yes, it, it was quite a struggle, I suppose. Um, in a sense too, we were happy enough with the, with the number we got in the end, um, because it, it, it is a, you know, a small scale study, but I suppose um, for me, just doing the coding and that on the interviews, um, we did reach saturation, we, it, it, was, it was repeating itself, what was coming up again and again, and, and there was that, um, shared um, ground between um, um, in both jurisdictions. So it was... Um, May I ask whether or not uh, ASTI or TUI would have been interested in helping you to conduct the survey? I've, I've tried them before and um, uh, not, not that easy to get them to advertise. Uh, I, think they're, I think they're asked quite a lot. Um, and I think they, they might conduct their own survey and I hope I hope something like that does happen going forward. Um, but I think there is that reluctance among teachers um, 
to actually identify as non-religious and, and to speak out about it because I suppose, um, you know, from the time they enter a school, there are assumptions and expectations placed on them and they learn very quickly, um, you know, what the norm is and that it's not very wise to step outside that. This is a terrible situation. Mm. Thank you. Can, can I ask a quick question? I know, I know um, James, you and I have spoken about this before, about maybe the difference in terms of, well, at least uh, religious education teachers in Northern Ireland compared to the rest of the UK. Um, is that, is, uh, I mean, what, what are the numbers like in terms of non-religious te teachers just more generally across, across the population of both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland? Do, do we have any data on that? No, we don't have any data. We don't know how many non-religious teachers are out there. Part of that problem is what is a non-religious teacher? Um, and we have, you know, we did include in our, sur in our uh, uh, um, research people who said, well, you know, I don't believe in uh, anything, but, you know, I was raised a Catholic and I still feel like I'm somehow a cultural Catholic or whatever, but I don't believe. So, you know, we were, we did spread the net very widely in terms of what we defined as non-religious, uh, but no, there are no statistics. Um, and uh, I, I just reiterate what Kate has said, that people, we, I was really surprised at how, um, how difficult it was to find people. And when we did, <sighs> they said, um, you know, we just keep our head down. Uh, we're scared to speak out. We, you know, there. And when we said to them, "Are there many non-religious people in your school?" They would say, "I don't really know," because we would. I would never talk about it. I would never like open up and self-identify as non-religious. So not even the people who were non-religious knew in their own school how many non-religious people there were. We we certainly find that with parents. Um, a lot of parents will contact us and they're on their own and, and they don't speak out about it. But see, those parents that do speak out, they find out very quickly that there's actually <laughs> quite a few of them uh, and, and they sort of bond together in some way. And um, that certainly happened in um, a primary school just down the road here from us when you know, there was uh, a a, a really awful um, preacher coming into the school. It was meant to be in there for a week of lessons, and it was um, on the very first day they caught on that this was inappropriate, and that the, the parents bonded together and had it removed, and actually had some policies put in place in order to make sure that they knew what school speakers were coming in. So, I think it's it is interesting. I, I wonder how many more sort of non-religious teachers there are out there that you know don't feel that they can speak up, and it's yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a really, really good um, bit of work we've done. Um, I'm really, really happy with it. Cargan. Okay, Aaron. Um, next question is from Rita. Rita, can you unmute yourself there? Thank Hi. Um, yeah, kind of a similar uh, vein to the previous question. Obviously, with primary teaching in the South, I think you have to go to a religious specialised training college in primary teaching. Uh, in secondary teaching, generally you have a primary degree and whatever, and then you do teaching as a further degree. But in the handful of direct secondary teaching courses that there are in the South, I know, you know, the Home Ec Teachers Specialist College, one of the few extra subjects you can do with Home Ec is religion. And um, so I would assume that that does have an impact and non-religious people who are interested in teaching as a job are put off and whether that's affecting ones and twos or dozens and scores of people every year. Um, it's hard to know, but it's interesting. I assume it's very similar in the North from what's been uh, shared already, but are there any thoughts on doing research amongst students? I've certainly noticed myself with people I know who have trained to be teachers or are, tra are training to be teachers, that it, it really is a much more conservative atmosphere than other college uh, situations. And someone I know, now she is Catholic and it, it wouldn't bother her, but who has uh, just got one of her first kind of opportunities for a permanent post in teaching. It doesn't sound to me like a job. It sounds much more as if she's a student in the school, the relationship that she has with the principal. And um, so are there any thoughts on that kind of atmosphere that we generally have in education on this island where, you know, it's not just an historical accident that 
the churches play such a strong role in our education. They know how important it is to maintain the power that they have. And I think it's absolutely true. The teachers who are saying it's not just the law, it's not just the black and white on paper of what's allowed, it's also the culture. And we have a culture where even in, you know, the less religious scenarios or setups, whatever they are, religion is the assumed norm. And it's not just assumed, it's so heavily protected by these big institutions. And um, so I'd just be interested if there's any kind of info or speculation about student teachers or people who are thinking about going into teaching and the impact that it is having. Certainly in the South, obviously the requirement for Irish in primary teaching can be um, off-putting in a problematic way, possibly for us getting people of different backgrounds, for us getting, you know, uh, people who weren't originally born in Ireland themselves, etc., into teaching. Um, and there are certainly people living on the border who live in the South and teach in the North just to get out of that provision. Yeah, I, I suppose there has been some research done. I, I think um, Manuela Hines, would there be, she would have some work done on, um, you know, the that many teachers in uh, schools are white, Irish and Catholic. Um, there's more work done at primary level, so it, it is an area that needs some further research. And also Patricia Kiernan would have done a cross-border study and she would, would have found that while there is diversity in the teaching profession, it's less um, than in other um, graduate programs. And also that um, students can experience negativity uh, from college lecturers, uh, particularly those how, who are atheist or uh, Muslim or um, I can't remember the, actually the, the details of it, but that students do um, uh, face negativity if they go against the ethos within the college at times as well. I see. And I can I can share those um, articles with you as well. That's great. Thanks for the question, Rita. OK, um, last question. Uh, apologies if I don't get your name right. Dreyrenstrand? Dreyrenstrand? You can just unmute yourself there. Hiya, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Hiya, sorry, I'm going to have to apologise because I've actually been driving to my mother's house while attending this meeting. Um, so I'm sorry if you hear background noise. But my question is also about primary schools. Um, so I am a primary school teacher in the South and I would myself identify as non-religious and I have two children who are both going to attend the same school as I teach in, which is a Catholic school. Um, <clears throat> they haven't been baptized, obviously, but we're in the very strange situation and I know I'm not the only person in a situation. So the question is not particular to myself, it's more a question of legality. I could end up in a strange situation whereby I would be asked to teach um, the sacrament, so to teach communion or confirmation to a second or sixth class group with my children in that class who I am trying to remove from the teaching of religion. And I think the question I'm asking is, is that enshrined in law that you could ask somebody to teach them? Is the mandatory teaching of religion within schools as in can a teacher pull out or maybe this question is actually not related entirely to the or to the discussion at hand but um I suppose is it enshrined in law that somebody who's employed within a Catholic school that it is mandatory for them to teach sacraments and to teach religion even when they identify as a non-religious person Do you want I can I can touch on uh, Kate, do you want to is this uh, I might be asking the wrong question to the wrong group I'm sorry no, if I am I can certainly answer in a friend the perspective of Northern Ireland but I'm sure James can as well James do you want to take that well I, I can just start and say that there is only one group one school group that is uh, that has a conscience clause and that's in the north and controlled schools um, teachers can opt out from teaching religious education. Uh, the mm -hmm. same law does not apply to any other school in the north or the south of Ireland. 
So you can't uh, effectively, if you're required to teach religion, then that's the school will require and can require you to teach religion. Um, Kate may want to add to that. Yeah, I, I think I think James is right. They can require you to do it. And um, it could be interpreted that you are going against the religious ethos of the school by by not doing it. And then they could you could legally be dismissed. Um, if if they can prove that one teacher objecting to the teaching of um, of the sacraments um, will impact on will negatively impact the ethos of the school, so it's yeah. it, it's the interpretation. The devil here is in the detail, and it's um, it's how people might interpret that understanding of school ethos and how not upholding that ethos then would be understood. Um, and I, there isn't a test case case in in Southern Ireland for that. I really hope I'm not going to be it. <laughs> 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 Let's hope this is a problem that doesn't come up and they just have the good sense not to put me in that class. <laughs> but um, no, sorry, I just thought that you would be the, group, the kind of group who would have information on that matter. Thanks for your answer. That's great. Thank you for your question. Okay, I think we'll move on now. Hang on, just um, let's see. Now, there we go. Okay, we're going to move on to our final uh, speaker for tonight. Um, Dave, you with us there, yeah? Okay, one second. No, can you hear me okay there? Can indeed, yes. Perfect. So listen, I hope we can uh, get past those uh, technical problems we were having there earlier. I've sent you the, the presentation by email and perhaps if you can share at your end, uh, I'll be able to talk and, and ask you to share them. Perfect. Okay. You can see that there, yeah? I can indeed, Tony. That's great. Right. So, so listen, um, thank you very much for, for inviting us to, um, to contribute to your conference this evening. I'm going to kick straight into it because I have a fair bit to cover. So if you want to flick onto the next slide there, Tony. Okay, so um, just by way of introduction, perhaps I'll talk a little bit about education equality, uh, who we are, you know, where we've come from and so on. So uh, the education equality campaign group emerged from a meeting that was hosted by the Humanist Association of Ireland in 2015. Uh, and the group was officially launched on the 12th of December that year with two goals, very simple, equal access and equal respect by which we mean equal access to school for all children, regardless of religion, and equal respect in school for all children, regardless of religion. And that second point means, in effect, what we're campaigning for and advocating is that uh, religious instruction and worship and sacramental preparation, all of that should be moved outside school hours. It should no longer form part of the core curriculum, and it should be offered on an optional opt-in basis outside core school hours, preferably at the end of the school day, uh, so after school. So, so that's what we're campaigning on. Now, we're on the go, I think, pretty much six years now. So you might be asking, well, you know, what do we have to show for our efforts um, after, after six years of campaigning? So if you could move on to the next slide there, Tony. Thank you very much. So I would argue really sort of three things we can kind of chalk up as successes, if you like. First and foremost, the baptism barrier has been largely repealed. Um, the Education Admissions to, Admission to Schools Act of 2018 has essentially um, removed the exemption that applied uh, for Catholic schools, which currently make up uh, almost 90% of Ireland, Ireland's or the Republic of Ireland's primary schools. So the uh, baptism barrier by and large is gone. Now, the Minister for Education at the time didn't go quite as far as we would have liked. We wanted the barrier removed in all schools. He didn't go quite that far, but he went most of the way there. The second thing I would say that we have managed to do, which is really no small feat given the, the size of our group and the fact that we are a group of volunteers, we have established, I think it's fair to say, a pretty firm presence um, in the media and in political circles at this stage. So the media know us, the papers know us, um, the Irish Times certainly know us, and they've been very good to, good to us this year on their letters page, uh, but also in political circles. We're well known, and I think it's fair to say well respected as well. Uh, and then finally, there is at least some anecdotal evidence that schools are, at least some schools, 
are slowly becoming more sensitized to the issue of religion. And again, I think I would attribute that at least in part to, to our campaign work. And the pictures that you see there are from our Gathering for Change uh, march in the, I think it was July of, of 2016. Uh, that march was primarily centered on, on the baptism barrier and equal access to schools. As, as you can see, there was quite a, quite a good uh, turnout. Next slide. Now, so in terms of who we are and how do we see ourselves, um, hopefully this is how others see us as well. So although our origins, you know, uh, date back to a meeting that was hosted by the HAI in 2015, we as a group were an independent group. We don't endorse any particular religious or non-religious worldview. Um, I would say we have a very good understanding of the education system. So we actually kind of, we'd like to think we know what we're talking about in the area of education. Uh, but equally, we've got a very good skill set in terms of legal expertise and policy making expertise. So various different members of our group um, have been kind of, if you like, for want of a better word, selected for their skills uh, in different areas. So it means that we, when we're giving... Um, we don't give legal advice that's you know we're not able to give legal advice in the formal sense but we can certainly advise people as to how they might approach different issues uh, we've a good understanding also of the business of government the business of legislation how legislation is drafted and becomes law and all of that type of thing and um, we focus very much on affected families uh, that's, you know, really from our inception in 2015, when some of those who were involved in the original core group uh, were actually affected themselves by the issue of religious discrimination in schools. And we have retained that focus. Having said that, this year we have tried to expand that focus somewhat onto teachers, uh, notably with an opinion piece that we published in the In Touch magazine, which is the magazine of the INTO, the Irish National Teachers Organization. That uh, two page spread was published last month. So the September edition, if you haven't seen it, it's worth taking a look at that. We have tried to broaden our focus, if you like, and also uh, acknowledge the human rights abuses that are endured by, by teachers in our, in our schools. Uh, and finally, we're politically independent. So uh, we're politically active, if you like, in that we reach out to different political parties and candidates, but we don't endorse any particular political party or any particular political candidate. Next slide. Okay, so the team, who are we? So there's eight of us currently. Um, Alison Moore is our social media officer. Paddy Bonahan, uh, some of you might, might have heard his name before as well from... from uh, his uh, campaign back in it began in 2015, and he managed to collect 20,000 signatures uh, on a petition to remove the baptism barrier. Uh, he's a member of our group now for many years. We have Sarah Lennon, who's events officer, myself as communications officer, Rob Sadlier, our human rights officer, and uh, we have a. Sorry, we're not looking at quite the same presentation here, so it, does, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, we have a primary school teacher, a primary school principal, and a secondary school principal. Next slide. Okay, so uh, how do we work? We're a voluntary uh, unpaid group of, of parents and concerned citizens. Um, different people, as you saw on the previous slide, take the lead in, in different areas. Um, so, but that isn't, if you like, it's not rigid. So we all kind of dig in and help each other out. Our legal form is that we're an unincorporated, unincorporated association uh, that keeps things flexible. It minimizes the sort of administrative workload that comes from campaigning. Um, all of our outputs are a team effort, as I alluded to a moment ago. So even the likes of this presentation you're watching now, if you like, has been vetted by everybody else. Uh, our letters to the editor, opinion pieces uh, and all of that. Uh, I'm doing the, the bulk of all of that writing these days, but um, I make sure to run everything by everybody else as well. Um, we're a virtual team, so obviously during COVID, uh, that goes without saying, but even prior to COVID, we, we work almost exclusively remotely. We meet up the odd time when we can, but by and large, we're dealing with each other, um, you know, through our through our phones, through email, through WhatsApp and so on. And we've managed, I think, to remain quite an effective group, uh, even, or, even though we're not physically uh, seeing each other too often. And then finally, we have no funding so we any any minor ancillary costs that might arise occasionally we just pay for ourselves and it just again it just keeps the keeps the administration side the legal side as clean as possible 
Next slide. Okay, so our current campaign focus. Um, so this year in 2021, we've had a particularly big effort in communications, um, both social media, which is a sort of an ongoing effort, um, but also press and radio. Um, the press have been quite good to us this year. It has taken a huge amount of work uh, and I have I have had to pester people on more than one occasion to run pieces that they've agreed to run and to respond to emails and so on. Um, but it has it has sort of reaped reaped rewards. We've also been on radio then as well. And then in terms of political outreach, so again, that's an ongoing process. But this year in particular, we had the Dublin Bay South by-election uh, and we would have reached out to all of the different candidates in that by-election. We asked them a very simple question. You can see it there in the little infographic in the bottom left. Do you support moving all faith formation outside school hours on an opt-in basis? So that was the question, very simple, that was asked to all candidates. Um, some candidates replied. Where they replied, we shared their answers. Where they didn't reply, we named and shamed, as you can see there. We received no responses from those candidates for the Dublin Bay South by-election. But other than that, we don't make any further comment. So we don't advise people which way they should vote. That's not our business. We're in the business of providing people with information. Uh, as you can see there, we have sought a meeting on more than one occasion with Minister Norma Foley. Uh, unfortunately, we've been unsuccessful to date, but that's it's not through uh, not through want of trying. Uh, and finally, uh, again, uh, we have been in in regular contact with education spokespeople from from different parties, and that's really an ongoing effort. Next slide. Okay, so that just gives you a snapshot of some of the publications that we featured in this year, some of the radio radio stations we've been on. Um, you'll see there, for just for example, I won't go through them all, um, the Irish Times have published, I think, five or six of my letters this year. Um, I have another one there I've sent into them. Uh, sometimes it's hit and miss, sometimes they publish them, sometimes they don't. Um, but they've been very good to us this year, we really can't complain. The website schooldays.ie, it's a very popular website. It has just published in the last couple of days. Uh, an article I wrote from them for them, which is a very kind of informative, neutral, sober argument uh, or article, I should say, uh, advising parents uh, as to what their rights are. If you're a non-religious family, how do you navigate the Irish education system? Uh, and I wrote an article for them, which they very kindly published. Uh, and then you see various other publications there, including Hot Press, who haven't published my piece yet, but I'm hoping that they will, um, perhaps even on Friday, but certainly certainly quite soon. I'm looking forward to seeing that uh, opinion piece in print. So the, the effort here really is to try and get beyond, you know, we're not trying to preach to the converted here. We're trying to get the message out right across the media landscape, both on radio and in the press and on social media and in, if you like, uh, industry magazines such as In Touch magazine, you know, so to really uh, hammer the point home, reach as wide uh, an audience as, as possible. You can move on there, Tony. Okay, so I'm gonna do a, a little bit of a, a, a deep dive, if you like, uh, I won't take too long on it, but I do want to look a little bit more closely at this notorious Flourish RSE programme. So for those of you who might not have heard of it, it's a new relationships and sexuality education program uh, developed by the Irish Bishops Conference for use in Catholic run primary schools. Um, this program immediately proved controversial. Um, I'll give you a few of these quotes and I can't even believe I'm saying these words in 2021, but this is a new program. Here goes, puberty is a gift from God. We are perfectly designed by God to procreate with him. The church's teaching in relation to marriage between a man and a woman cannot be omitted. Um, Flourish has a couple of hundred pictures and photographs. Not a single one, not one, features a same-sex couple. And then a lesson on safety and protection advises senior infant children to say the angel of God prayer. You can move on there. Thank you. So, and another quote here, the assumptions of yesteryear in terms of faith formation within the family no longer stand. In many cases, the classroom will be the first and possibly only place that the uh, child considers their actions in terms of the teaching of the gospels. Now, I'll basically translate that into plain English. Essentially what it's saying there is, um, you know, we don't care if you're non-religious, uh, if you're not gonna raise your kids as Catholic, we will essentially is what is what that's saying if parents won't do their their work do their job we're going to have to do it for them you can move on then um so what are the takeaways from this from this program 
Uh, first and foremost, I think we need to recognize that it does demonstrate the enormous power that the Catholic Church still has in our schools. So despite the enormous controversy um, from this particular program, the government didn't intervene. They haven't opposed it. I think they were a bit embarrassed by it, to be honest. Um, but they haven't actually intervened and said that it, you know, it, that it's they're objecting to it and it can't be run. So the fact is that this program has been introduced in the vast majority of Irish primary schools. It does demonstrate the pervasive influ influence of the integrated curriculum to the general public. So sometimes it can be difficult to explain to people what the integrated curriculum is. Well, now we can tell people exactly what it is because we can just tell them puberty is a gift from God. There's an example of the integrated curriculum. Um, it has offered a new avenue for challenging the role of religion in schools. Um, there's no question about that, as we'll see in a moment. Um, and in my view, it has been a public relations disaster, frankly, for the Catholic Church. Um, they, they, they have really been somewhat running for cover um, fr from this. And the, um, the impact of that will be seen on our next slide. So this is a story that, that we broke. Um, we were behind it, frankly, uh, together with uh, a group of parents in County Wicklow who reached out to us. Now, this was their initiative. They didn't want their school, which was a Catholic-run school, to implement this new programme. Um, they were quite adamant about that. They wrote to the school. We provided a little bit of moral support and practical support. And then uh, on Sunday, the 13th of June, as you can see there, I wrote a press release that morning and sent it out at about half past 11 in the morning. And, you know, no sooner had the press release gone out than Patsy McGarry from the Irish Times was on the phone to me. And long story short, I was on News Talk Radio from seven o'clock the following morning and then just more and more radio stations back to back. So the story really snowballed. Um, and there were several other schools who also took the same decision. So at the very least, I think I would say that that's perhaps a little bit embarrassing when Catholic run schools are refusing to implement Catholic based relationships and sexuality education. Next slide. OK, so what are our core messages as a group? Um, so, again, as I mentioned or alluded to earlier, personal stories we think are very persuasive. So we try and share the experiences of affected families and affected children. You can see an example there from a, an opinion piece I wrote about a girl called Molly, um, who is eight years old, who is opted out, who sits on her own at the back of the class in County Cork. So people can relate to a girl like Molly of eight years of age a lot easier than they can to abstract arguments and statistics and so on. Uh, we try and use the word consent as often as we can to get across the notion that it does actually require parents' consent before you can evangelize a child. We emphasize the human rights angle. Um, we try to go for simple arguments. So a line that I've used, for example, before society has changed, our schools must too. It's a, it's a pithy, short, bite-sized argument, which is rather difficult to argue with, frankly. We do use statistics, as you'll see in a moment, and we, uh, we try and normalize opting out. We try and emphasize that opting out is a perfectly normal thing to do so that the message gets out there that it can be done. If you move on to the next slide there, Tony. So you'll see our graph there that, that uh, illustrates the trend in terms of non-religious marriages as against Catholic marriages in Ireland over the last 40 years. I think that graph really speaks for itself. There's not much more to be said about it. Uh, other than I have been making a huge effort to get that graph published absolutely everywhere I can, short of plastering it onto buses and bus stops. Um, we've really, you know, managed to get that graph out into lots of different opinion pieces that we've published, uh, including the, the piece I just mentioned on schooldays.ie. Um, it really illustrates the, the change that has taken place in Irish society over the last 40 years. I think it's uh, a picture paints a thousand words and so does a graph like this. We can move on then. Okay, so as a group, our strategy, I would argue, has, has sort of five main components. We want to communicate the issues, we want to drive debate, make noise effectively and influence public opinion. Um, in doing so, we're also trying to create political pressure. We want to empower parents, and I think it's important to recognise that some change can come from the ground up, as we saw in the case of lack of national school, parental action um, can actually drive change from below, from, from the ground up. We want to sensitise schools and school staff to the issue of religious uh, instruction and why that is now more and more controversial, and I do think that the message has been slowly sinking in. Uh, and then finally, we just maintain ongoing political contact. 
And it goes without saying, in addition to all of this, we do do work in the background, uh, in, in the legal area, if you like, the human rights area. And we, we try and, you know, uh, keep things on the go there that we can't always discuss publicly. But uh, there is also a, an important legal dimension, if you like, to our, to our work. We can move on to the next slide then. So the, the theme of this conference is obviously what are the challenges faced by the non-religious? Uh, and I would say from our perspective, when you use a term like the non-religious, the, the assumption is that everybody agrees that there is such a thing as a demographic that we call the non-religious. Unfortunately, in reality, the political establishment and the Department of Education, they don't really accept that such a demographic exists. Uh, and I suppose uh, concomitant with that is a reluctance to accept the very simple concept that, you know, that the human and constitutional right to hold non-religious beliefs deserves recognition and deserves uh, protection. And then, as I alluded to earlier, um, the Minister for Education, for some reason, seems to be very reluctant to meet us. Um, that goes for the current minister and the previous minister. And it wasn't, uh, it's not since 2016 that we have actually met with a Minister for Education. So the government, I think, has made it very clear, look, they're not prepared to face up to this issue. They're not going to issue guidelines governing schools, opt out arrangements. They won't recognize the problem of religious discrimination and they won't acknowledge the failure of divestment, probably because there's no real political will behind it. We can move on to the next slide then. And we're nearly at the end. Um, so it's very hard to say exactly what the future holds, um, but I'll, I'll make a stab at my crystal ball. Uh, and I'll say first and foremost that we aren't going anywhere as a group. We're going to maintain public pressure as much as we can. I do think political pressure uh, on this issue is going to gradually, incrementally increase uh, thanks to a range of factors, not just obviously to our own work, but also to the efforts of other stakeholders, potentially the NCCA, which is the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment. Um, teachers and principals themselves might uh, implement or be drivers of change to some extent. You've also got the reports from various different international human rights bodies that can all sway public opinion and indeed the political appetite, and then just ongoing continued demographic change. Um, the commitment in the programme for government to establish a citizens' assembly on the future of education, it could be a game changer, and that's probably our best hope at this point, is that the government will make good on its commitment in the programme for government, there will be an assembly on the future of education, and uh, flowing from that potentially is uh, the possibility of a referendum. I do think probably we're heading for a referendum on this at some point, even though we feel that our proposals don't necessitate a referendum, because we believe that our proposals are constitutional. Um, politically, uh, if not legally, uh, a referendum may ultimately be unavoidable on this issue. So we do have to kind of be prepared to, to fight that battle in the public domain if, if and when the day comes. Next slide then. Okay, so this is um, almost the very last slide. So just uh, very briefly, you know, what can you do to help if you're watching this, this presentation this evening? I would say, look, you know, please uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, give, our, give our posts a like and a share, it all helps. Um, sign and share our Uplift petition. So we've, we've over 5,000 signatures at the moment uh, for our petition to remove religion from the school day and offer it on an optional basis outside uh, school hours. I would, I would suggest you consider opting your child out. I think we're all familiar with what the problems are with opt-outs, but at the very least, do consider doing it. Uh, every child that's opted out, uh, every bit of pressure will ultimately help. Although again, uh, I stress it's, it's, the, it's, it's a decision for each individual parent, obviously, as to whether or not they do. Um, as we saw in the case of Lacken, you can write to the Board of Management to oppose Flourish. Better still do it with other parents. You do have a right to be consulted in relation to RSE, even though it never happens in practice, you do have a right under the law. And then looking forward a little bit further, I would say talk to your friends and family about the religion question on next year's census form. And um, that will also all feed into this, this wider debate. And needless to say, you know, keep in touch with your TDs. Next slide there, Tony. So that's, uh, that's our petition there. Um, I realise that petitions don't change the world by any means. But um, do, do sign it if you haven't done already, because I think even if petitions don't necessarily change everything, they can certainly, they can certainly show people what's wrong with the world and, and add uh, publicity to, to an issue. So um, that's me wrapped up. You can, you can just put on the very last slide there, if you would, Tony. And there's a picture there, I think, from our, uh, from our campaign there. And that's what we're all about, uh, equality, simple as.
So very thanks very much for your attention and over to you. That's great. Thanks for that, David. Very, very informative. And uh, I do have to say, um, on a personal basis, when I saw the details of the Flourish program, as a parent with two children in primary school, it's frightening. It's absolutely frightening. Now, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. I managed to get my kids into a multi-denominational school, but it's unbelievable. It's the stuff that's in it. It really is. And like you said, in 2021, there's no place for it in a progressive education. There, there really isn't, you know. Now, sorry, we have, um, so we're open up to our final Q&A session for tonight. And um, first question comes from Peter O'Hare. Peter, if I can ask you to unmute yourself there, please. Peter O'Hara. Oh, uh, apologies, apologies. Yeah. I do need glasses. Go ahead. Okay. Your name isn't LJ off road. I've forgotten your name, even though you've just presented. Well, David, it's David Graham is David, my name. David, sorry about that. I mean, I heard you, I figured, you, I got your name originally. So yeah. um, on the matter of a referendum, I don't want you to explain why you think it's not necessary because I already agree with you. But if there were to be a referendum, what do you think is the article to be altered and what type of alteration? Okay, so I'm, I'm, no, uh, I'm no legal expert now and I, I, don't, uh, I don't pretend uh, to be, but the, the rights as I understand it, there, there is a, an article that refers to religious and moral education of, of children. Um, there's probably something that we need to be done with that. And there's also uh, the, the constitutional arguments defending the status quo are pretty are pretty flimsy. But um, the, the rights around land and land ownership and to what extent, though, you know, ownership of land confers a right to run a school in a particular way. It's quite a complex area. And I really I don't have the expertise to say exactly what that would be. Uh, I do know that Aidan Ariardon, for example, a Labour politician, has been quite vocal on this, and he's adamant that he believes a referendum is, is going to be required. So I, I can't give you a kind of a synopsis other than to say that it would probably require amending or removing a number of different articles. But all of that would really be, to, be contingent upon the recommendations of a citizens' assembly. And we simply like that that assembly hasn't been convened yet. If it is convened, we don't know what will come from us. But in all likelihood, if I'm kind of thinking of this debate like a game of chess, that's the moves I, I would see happening. Public uh, public campaign, public advocacy from the likes of ourselves, ultimately political pressure, ultimately a citizen assembly on the future of education. That would probably take about a year or six months or some some decent amount of time, and then that would re that would put forward recommendations. The government then would would ultimately put that to the people. I really don't see that happening in the term of the current government, if I'm honest. Um, but uh, but it would it would be a complex area because there there are enormous rights that come from the the, the church's ownership of of an enormous amount of land on which our schools are built. Um, uh, I, I don't, the only part of your answer there that I can see worth asking you a little bit more is where you said a predictor TD says there should be a referendum. Does he actually say what article would be changed? Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head exactly what, what, he, what he said, but uh, he, he has detailed a number of different articles. Well, yes. I'm going to leave now and not speak anymore, but I think this is a mistake and if the Citizens Assembly has loads of stuff on which to act based on the existing constitution, if it gets the right help and representation from yourself and Atheist Ireland. But thanks very much for your presentation, which was very good. Th thank you very much. I appreciate that. And if I can just add one more thing, it's simply to say we always have to be sensitive to the distinction between political pressure and, and legal requirements. So for example, if you think back to the same-sex marriage referendum, there was a pretty strong legal case to say that a referendum wasn't required on that issue. Um, however, politically it was considered unavoidable. And, and sometimes we can get into areas of constitutional law where the, there might be, the balance might tip in favor of a political judgment rather than a legal judgment. So what I'm saying effectively is that even if the recommendations of a citizens assembly didn't strictly speaking necessitate a referendum, if the changes that were proposed were far reaching enough, uh, the government might require the cover offered by a referendum so that the government don't get blamed for what happens, they can put it to the people. So th th there is politics in this as well. There's always politics behind behind constitutional referendums, you know. Can I come in there? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, from 
from my point of view, having worked for a long time for equality education, um, removing the bat baptismal ba barrier and getting uh, faith formation outside school hours is only a very small part of what we need to be campaigning for. That just means that your children now, if you're Buddhist parents, the children of Buddhists, the children of atheists, agnostics or whatever, they are now still going to a Catholic school. This patronage, the bishops still have control over who they appoint to the boards. To me, that is just an Irish solution to an Irish problem, which we should move away from. There needs to be a transference of um, patronage. Why is the state not coming together and saying, sorry, this is not acceptable anymore. The patronage needs to be changed. And we also know there's a very successful model template out there. Educate Together have been working for years and it has been researched up and down as a, a, a wonderful example. There are 114 schools and the vast majority of them, the established ones, have huge waiting lists. So the parents actually want that kind of education. But so to me, I would really love you to get involved in a campaign that is much broader than children being expected to still go to a Catholic school and they will still have control, they will still have the power. And you talked about the integrated um, curriculum. They will still permeate it as best they can. We all know how clever they are. And it will be through the whole curriculum. Even if you just move faith formation outside school hours. I've said it now, that's it. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Uh, thank, thank you very much for, for that. Uh, the way I'd answer that, first of all, is to say, you know, we are where we are, <laughs> you know, like you say, why don't, why can't we move to a model where the church aren't involved at all and where we divest? We've come through 10 years of a divestment process, 10 years, it's 10 years almost to the day, uh, in a few months time anyway, it'll be 10 years since the Forum on Patronage and Pluralism reported. In, in the meantime, I could count the number of schools that have been divested on two hands. So we take a pragmatic approach. And the reason we take a pragmatic approach rather than, if you like, uh, a more ambitious approach, if you want to put it that way, is for a very, very simple reason that we need change now and we need it to happen now, not in 20 or 30 or 40 years time. I agree with you in principle that we do need to move towards, if you like, a more secular type of, of education model. I totally agree. And I think most people in this space are broadly speaking, pushing in the same direction. There's a couple of major problems with that though. First of all, the church owned the land. Okay, so to, in order to bring about that level of change, it's going to be legally complex because we talk about the church as though it is one entity, but it isn't. It's not a single legal entity. All of these schools are, are owned by hundreds, if not thousands of different trusts and different local entities around the country. So in order to prize control of those assets, which they are, and all the land ownership rights that go with them, you can't just unilaterally say, we're taking your land. You can't do a CPO on 3000 schools, a compulsory purchase order. Um, the legal effort involved in removing schools from church control would be extremely onerous and it would be very expensive. If the church were, were to be paid for the land, now again, I'm being devil's advocate here, but realistically, you can't just say that's now our land. If you're paying them the market value, um, I live in Malahide, for example, I have no idea what, what the land that Oliver Plunkett School is worth. That's our local school. It's the biggest Catholic school in the country. I'm guessing it's tens of millions of euro is the land for just that one school. And you multiply that by 2,800, 2,900 schools. So between the legal complexity and the costs involved, what that translates into from our point of view is an unnecessary delay. We're campaigning for change today. Uh, not for our great great grandchildren. We uh, we want them to be, you know, to have a better education system as well. But we want change to happen now. And so, what we do from a messaging and a campaign point of view is to offer what we regard as a compromise between the current status quo and the type of system that you're describing. By moving religious instruction to the end of the school day, it becomes optional. It's not a word. It's if that happened in the morning, there would still be debate. There's no question. But we have to we have to start from where we are, not from where we wish we were. I think you're on mute, Tony. You are on mute, Tony. 
Okay, that's grand. Um, apologies for that now. I had a bit of noise going on in the background here. Yes, I'm, I'm very conscious that we're running late. So um, our last question of the night, Kate, if you'd like to unmute yourself there. Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you for that, David. And I, I definitely need, we think we need a citizens assembly. And I just wanted to ask a question there around when you um, showed the slide of the core members, uh, the teachers' names weren't included, and I just wondered the reason behind that. Was it that they wanted to uh, maintain their anonymity? Yes, unfortunately, the Irish education system being what it is, um, generally speaking, uh, the teachers that speak with us and, and deal with us and work with us prefer to remain anonymous. Uh, in some cases because of potential direct impact on themselves, in other cases perhaps because they have, you know, even if they're teaching in a multi-denominational school, their children might not be attending a multi-denominational school and they're worried about possible repercussions for their children. Um, anonymity, unfortunately, is a, is a recurring feature of the Irish education system. Generally speaking, uh, when parents contact us and share, share their stories with us, uh, they only agree to talk to journalists if they do agree uh, on, a, on an anonymous basis. Uh, and that really, if you like, it, it sums up the problem. There was an article, a very good article there in the Irish Times yesterday. It wasn't written by us, it was written by somebody else, um, just in relation to the treatment of non-Catholic children in Irish schools. And there were two school principals who were quoted in that article. Both were from uh, Catholic ethos schools. Both of those principals quoted in the Irish Times article remained anonymous. They, they chose to remain anonymous. But yet one of them was defending the status quo and saying that the school was inclusive. So when you have people saying our schools are very inclusive and the school I run is very inclusive, but yet they won't go on the record and identify themselves, that really speaks volumes. Teachers are, teachers are afraid. And uh, a final fact I'll give you there, and this is quite shocking, but not surprising. Over 80%, over 80% of the LGBT teachers in denominational, Irish denominational schools uh, aren't out. That they don't talk about if it's a, a female teacher, she's not going to talk about her wife in school and, and, and so on. Um, they, they prefer to keep their sexuality to themselves because they're afraid that will have repercussions. Yeah. And yeah, thanks for that. And it, it does, it, it mirrors our research and that there is that glass ceiling and that, that, that fear and that need to role play. Um, and I suppose I just wanted to draw attention to the Louise O'Keefe case um, that. Uh, uh, the, the state have eventually decided to give compensation. And that ruling was from the European High Court that the state could not, um, they were uh, culpable, they were responsible for not protecting Louise O'Keefe um, in, her, in her school when the teacher sexually abused her, where the state had tried to um, place the culpability um, and the legal requirement for compensation on um, the school patron, but actually it, they were ruled against in the European High Court. And I think that has implications around the idea of religious freedom and protecting children's right to religious freedom in our schools, that the state can't hand over that responsibility. But that, that's just my, my thinking on it at the minute. No, you're you're absolutely you're absolutely right. I mean that that's a fact. The the Louise O'Keefe case set a very very important precedent uh, in terms of responsibility for what goes on within within our schools. Um, and there was another article actually in the Irish Times again today about uh, about other uh, victims of sexual abuse in schools, and the government was trying to evade its responsibility to those victims as well. And ultimately, um, they tried to, you know, uh, try to find a get out clause and ultimately they will have to pony up. I think in the latest budget, I think there's a, a, a there's an, a sum of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, a, sum, a sum set aside for the victims of that abuse. Look, unfortunately, that's the space we're in. Um, the state will always try and escape its responsibilities uh, in, in lots of different areas, but no more so, like particularly in the education system itself. Um, a lot of the, the attitudes to, to the education system from, from government uh, are keep, keep the system at arm's length, uh, you know, and I, I would be very, uh, I work in the area of education locally, I'm, I'm on a board of management, so I have, I have experience from that end as well. Uh, and I think that the entire structure of our education system is, is designed to remove accountability from government. But ultimately, you're correct. Um, if, 
if a child is being indoctrinated in school against the wishes of their parents and the human rights of that family are being breached, that's a responsibility ultimately of the state itself. And I think it's only a matter of time before we see that tested in court uh, and the government will, will be on a sticky wicket legally, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thanks, David. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. And a fantastic contribution. In fact, all of our guest speakers tonight, your contributions were amazing. They really were. Thank you so much. Very, very educational. Absolutely brilliant. Um, well, I think that is where we are going to have to leave. We have run over. So I just want to thank you for attending the um, 2021 All Island Fieldness Conference. And uh, of course, I would just like to thank Bide as well for the work he put in. Uh, working on this collaboration as well. Um, now, I, 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 Boyd will give you some details as well of his association. If you're not part of either associations, um, if, if you're down south, um, you can check us out at humanism.ie and we also have a YouTube channel where tonight's um, conference will be made available as well. Okay, so thank you for joining us and Boyd, it's over to you to sign off, please. Yes, again, thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening. It was it was excellent, and um, uh, it was a great uh, first endeavour with the Humanist Association of Ireland in an event like this. And if you're looking any more information on us, you can find it at humanism.org.uk. Thank you. That's great, guys. Take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Bye for now. <laughs>